Okay, so first of all, we talked about syntax of the of of uh, uh, functions, and we realized uh, for C plus plus to be able to bring the return type of uh, a function into the signature, because we we know that if I have int um, say foo over here, int uh, double, if I have something like this, and I have care foo int double. For C++, this is the same um, because you have the same signature over here. But to actually fix this problem, they said instead of actually to, to bring that return type into the uh, signature of the, of the function so it can be recognized when you are, oh, I gave you an example what happens, like why we need signature as templates and stuff generate a signature based on the, on the arguments that you have. And I said, bring the signature forward, which means you're saying auto. And in here, you're gonna say, I want it to return an integer. So this is the exact same thing as the other one. The only difference is that the return type is now pushed back into the signature part of the, uh, of the function, so the function can actually tell what it's returned. So keep that in mind. Anything. So if you are returning void, it's, it's not going to return anything that's void. So it's literally potatoes, potatoes. Just put auto and put the return type at the end with an arrow. That's all. Okay, so you're just saying, uh, and uh, the auto detects what uh, the foo is after the fact. So you know that when you say right over here, you write, uh, auto int is equal to 10. How does auto, oh, sorry, auto a equals to 10. How does auto understand what is a? What is a? It looks at what is it being assigned to and recognizes what the output is, right? So compiler can actually recognize what the type is after the fact, after the, uh, the variable is initialized, uh, after the variable is is declared over there. You can actually see what the type is going to be from the assignment, from what it is. So <clears throat> um, we do the same thing over here. We are saying I have a full function which is going to return void. And therefore, the compiler can decide. The compiler knows what the return type is. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> keep that in mind and get, you can get used to it by doing, but by writing it like this. So, uh, because what I'm going to talk about right now is C, I'm not going to use this format, but I'm going to switch to it later. I want you to understand something that, uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of freaky because students are already scared of pointers and um, for some unknown reason. And because of that problem, I am using the old syntax just, just to show you what I'm about to do. So pointers are going to go to another level at this point. We're going to do something completely different with pointers, which is going to <clears throat> um, give us lots of flexibility in our coding and help us uh, create logic that is not dependent on uh, logics outside of its own territory. Say you want to get an integer and you want to validate an integer. What is your validation uh, specification for getting an integer? You say, okay, I'm gonna get an integer, I gotta make sure that the integer that I'm receiving is all numeric, there is no alpha, al alphabetic or s symbols within my number, if it is, or, or the number doesn't start with that, if that's the case, then it's not an integer. And we do that using C in failure, right? Are we all okay with this? All right. But what else? Like if the integer I'm receiving is a phone number, then it's a completely different thing. If the integer I'm receiving is someone's age, then validation is completely different. So therefore, the code that is supposed to receive integer should know what the validation is. And for every single one, I have to write a different function, right? I have to have a get phone number. I have to have a get 
age. I have to have a get social insurance number. I have to have a get. So for every single different integer that I have, I have to write a different get function. But when you think about getting a, writing a program that receives an integer, what is the logic behind it? Just think about it for a second. If I actually write over here a get int, so I'm writing pure C in here. It's not C++. Of course, I'm using C in and C out, but just imagine scanf and printf instead of C in and C out. Okay, <clears throat> so if I write over here some get int over here, and this get int of mine uh, includes strings, so I can show messages too if I want to, but we'll talk about it later. So if I want to do a get int in here, obviously uh, I'm going to have a get in, uh, integer number that I want to get. We know that for a fact. There's no problem with that. Then I'm going to try to read that number, okay? So I'm going to try to read that number. I'm going to go C in uh, num, so I'm going to get the number. Then in here I'm going to say while, uh, I'm going to say while, uh, C in dot fail, right? Keep going back, correct? Keep going back, and I'm going to show an, an error message saying something like uh, invalid int integer. Try again, right? And obviously in here I'm going to say if C in fail, I'm going to clear the C in. cn dot clear, and no matter what, I'm going to do a cn ignore. Just to get rid of possible garbage and that backslash in, right? So I don't know if it's the right thing because I'm seriously every single time that I am writing an example over here, I don't. I try to come up with something that it just comes out of my mind. So if I make a mistake, you'll see it. If it doesn't work, you'll see it. This is OP244 and IPC144, right? So what I do, I receive, if I want to show a message, I can do that too. So in here I can uh, bring something like uh, a prompt in here saying, uh, uh, I forget about it, I'm not gonna make it a complete. But, but so it's gonna, re so in here I'm gonna say C out. <clears throat> Enter your age, right? And and a space after, then I'm going to say int age is equal to uh, get int, right? And see out. And show the age. So um, it's going to try to read the name. If it fails, it clears it. In any way, it's going to clear the buffer because even if they just enter an integer, we're going to have a backslash n, right? So it's going to clear. And if it fails, it's going to be garbage. It's going to clean up the garbage and a backslash n. So we are all good. And the problem over here is that the C and fail over here is not going to work because, uh, so let me just change it. I'm going to. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to change it like this. I'm going to say C in uh, clear, ignore, uh, boolean done is false, and in here I'm going to say while well, not done. While well, not done, and I'll say else done is true. Does that make sense? So, so in here, if it fails, it clears it. Done remains false. And it's going to say not done because it's not done. See out is going to print, which is fine. Let's even, you know why this gets printed, right? And why it doesn't get printed if it's lazy evaluation. Remember that? Confusing? I see blank eyes, I see like, what the hell is that? Are we okay with that? Or let me take it out. So if done is true, okay, if this not done is true, 
it's an and, it has to check the second condition to see if it's false or not. So it prints it. Okay? If the condition is false, false and anything is condition is is false, therefore it's not gonna check the second one. Therefore, no error message. Right? We're good with that? Okay. So it's gonna try to read the number. If it fails, it's gonna clear it and say ignore. I'm gonna bring the ignore out anyway for the backslash that we said. And put it over here so it's gonna ignore anyway. And the done remains false until uh, uh, CN doesn't fail. If CN doesn't fail, then we're good and it goes through. So hopefully when I run, run the program, three years later when it compiles, and I wanna come back to the point that I wanted to make. So if I enter garbage, it's gonna say mad integer try again. Um, I should have put an, a, a column over there, I put an exclamation mark. Now if I put over here, um, I don't know, uh, 34, it's gonna say H34. Are we good? Obviously, this has to be try again like that, and uh, uh, we could check to see if garbage, because if I do like this, because it's, I'm supposed to be foolproof, if I, if I do like this, if I talk like Yoda, I'm going to say 34 I am, okay? It's still going to accept the 34, although it cleans up the garbage, but we didn't check to see if any garbage is coming after. We could have tested that by receiving one integer. I'm not going to do that, okay? do it at home so it's not that foolproof. My point is, this is an age. An age is between what? Like, let's say we have to be in an age that we can write, so between 7 and 110 maybe. So that should be it. If, I, if, it, if, it, if it runs this program and it actually tells me what is your age and I put this, that's not right, correct? I have to actually write in here something to test to see if it is a valid thing or not. We all know that. So a second condition has to be done in here. I have to say if, now I have to put my validation in here. So I have to say if um, num is greater than uh, or equal to seven and num is less than or equal to 100, let's say if you're 100 years old, more than 100 years old, Enjoy your life, don't do computer programming. So uh, it, it, other than that, I'm gonna say C out in valid age. H try again. So the second layer of validation is added if C in is clear. Are we okay with this? Now if I run the program and somebody uh, writes over here 300, it's going to say, oh, it, it, it pre oh, invalid age to invalid integer, try again. Anyways, we'll fix that. Okay, so it's going to give us that error message that it's, that, that it's wrong, and it has to, they, ha they have to actually enter something right, okay? So we'll fix that redundancy, so in here, invalid, so I'm going to bring that C out thingy that I had over here in, uh, where do I put it? I'm going to put it here. So that's it. That's proper problem is solved. Okay, there you go. Now it's going to only say, say it like that. So, so, so this is fine. But what if I want to get number of students in a class? Then all I need to do is to change this thing between 2 and 36, let's say, if 35 people are supposed to be, correct? Validation is the same. I have to change the logic of my validation. Not only that, what if it's a port for a network, port number for networking? Then this has to actually get connected to the port to see if the port is busy, and if the port is busy, it should tell me it's wrong. So no matter what, the logic over here is supposed to receive an integer, see if it's a valid integer for that purpose, and change the validation, right? So what I need to change is that logic over and over and over. And because of that fact, I have to rewrite the code over and over and over, right? I don't want that. 
I want my get in to be solid and I want the logic to be provided to me whatever it is because I know the logic is supposed to return a boolean and receive an integer but how can I do that how can I pass logic as an argument Poof. you follow I can pass an integer as an argument I can pass a variable as an argument how can I pass code as an argument Think about it for a second. Huh? I can't. Functions are functions. You yeah, but then I have to rewrite my code again. Every single time I have to call write another function. I don't want that. I, want, I don't want the code to finish, to, to, to change. Now, keep that in mind. Let me introduce you to a beautiful pointer. Okay? So... So in here, I'm going to say the following logic, the following logic sh should change only. Uh, only the following logic should change to make the validation work for different different values, uh, different uh, types of value. Are we okay with this? So let's save this. And in here, I'm going to call it A. Why do we need pointer to functions? Let's go back in here. So now we know the need. Let's actually see how. All right. When we are talking about arrays, when I write an array, in C language. I write, I write something like this. I write an array, and my array is something like this. I write integer A50. OK? Can anybody put their 345 hat on and explain to me what happens behind the scene when I have that thing go with it? What, what that ar array is A is made up of in detail? Turning these lights on and off is like a hit and miss thingy. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. <laughs> and sometimes it goes to his memory and like three, three minutes later it does it. Yay. So can somebody tell me when I, oh, let me make it easy. What happens when I say integer A5? Can somebody tell me? Yeah, the program allocates a continuous memory block of uh, five inti uh, integer blocks. Perfect. So in this case, if this is 64 bit, an integer would be like eight bytes. Perfect. So it would be eight, 40, uh, the program will allocate continuous block of 40 bytes. Fantastic. And then what happens and, to uh, it? How do you access it? Yeah, uh, using pointer. Yeah, I was going to. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. How do we access it? Using pointer. Where is that pointer? Uh, we can reference it. No, where is that pointer? It actually creates a pointer that points to, that, to those five integers. A is the pointer. So A is an integer pointer, literally. A is literally an integer pointer pointing to those five integers. And we proved it in OOP244 saying that <clears throat> if I have something like this, if I have... If I have something like this and I go see out, see out target of A, that actually prints out 10. Because A is literally an integer pointer pointing to five integers. And we proved that one too using pointer arithmetic saying, if I say integer A plus 
two, <clears throat> two size of integers will be added to A, therefore target of A plus two will point to two integers further, which is going to be 30. Remember that? So that's how C language works. When you name something and you create something, that name that you're actually creating is a pointer pointing to the address of a bunch of stuff that you put over there. Do I make sense? Okay, and if you don't remember, please go back to OP244 pointers and watch the video from last semester. Okay, so remember, at name of an array is a pointer pointing to the beginning of that array. What is the type of that pointer? It's the type of the array. So if I had five employees, A would be an employee pointer. And when I say A plus one, the size of an employee in memory will be added to the address so the array could jump to the next thing. So that square bracket uh, that, you, uh, that you use, the index operator that you use, its original job is to see what is the type and add that many uh, uh, sizes to the pointer. So indexes in arrays work. So index in array is nothing, but that's why everything in C starts from zero. It means from the address of the beginning, go zero, zero integers further. So it becomes the first one. Are we clear about this? That name of this entity holds the address of the beginning of the data of that entity, right? How many different types of data I have in, compu in computers? That's IPC144, I think, if you can recall. You, I have two different types of data stored in memory. Do you remember that? Anybody remembers that? Data in memory is divided in two different categories. What are those, those two main categories? Everybody's looking at the void like, looking, yes, go ahead. No, that's two, two different types. That's two different types of memory too, no. Two, that's two different types of memory. I said two different types of data in memory. Huh? Huh? No, that's, that's, that's type of variables, primitive variables, two main categories of primitive variables. So what you're saying, they're all nice answers, but answer to a different question. RAM is what you pay and buy and put it so you can have memory. Huh? No, you're going way too far. Usually you give me good answers. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you to give me the right answer. <laughs> and she's, she's quiet back there sitting. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so. We have two major types of information stored in memory. One is the data you process. The second one is the logic that processes the data. When you execute a program, what happens? The compiler brings your executable in RAM, tells to CPU this is the beginning of the data that you are supposed to execute, then CPU executes the line of your code from RAM and it keeps going. And in those lines, you are telling to go to somewhere else in RAM and pick up your data. So we have two types of data in the memory raw data that is to be processed, logic that processes the data. Lo Wait, my dear, baby steps. Let's first understand what are the types of data when we talk about, it, right? So we agree that I, when I write this beautiful program of mine and I execute it, the, the executable that is 080oct05.exe is moved into memory and CPU jumps to the beginning of it and runs it. If you, hopefully you go to, I don't know, continue education to university and stuff like that, you actually study assembly language, then everything's gotta be whoo, crystal clear for you. But let's, let's understand that. Your code, your C code, what is C code? Is it human language or computer language? 
human language, right? It's not computer, it's us, it's our language. I know it's weird, but it is our language, okay? So it's human language, it gets translated into machine, co machine code, and the machine code is machine code, and that machine code actually goes into RAM. So the equivalent of this is going to go into, I said RAM is wrong, memory. It goes to memory. He puts back whatever the compiler chooses to put it in. It goes in there and gets executed. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? So beautiful. Now, now that we know that, let's write a very complicated function in here that I hope everybody understands. So I'm going to say over here, void add int a int b. Yeah, why not? Uh, and in here, I'm going to say C out A plus B. Everybody understands that thing? Or let's call it sum. Are we OK with that function? So now in here, I can have integer A integer x, integer y, and I can say sum x, y, and return 0. Whoop. And let's write another one. Uh, I'm going to say multiply. And that's going to be that. Or product, right? It's product of the two, not multiplication. So product. X and Y. And if I run the program over here, this beautiful thing happens, uh, which actually two numbers are printed over here. Are we OK with this? All right. When I wrote an array, what did the array's name hold? Someone. When I create an array, what does the name of the array hold? The address of the array in memory. When you create a function, the name of the function holds the address of the logic in memory which means I can actually see where they are. I can actually see where sum is. And I can see actually where the product is, if I type it properly. Somebody's actually writing this code right now? That's the address of sum and product in my memory when it was getting executed. And that's why when you forget the parentheses over there, you get this weird message like if you want to extract the address of the thing, you should do in this and that. Remember that? That's what it is. So the name of the function actually holds the address of the beginning of the logic. So only if I could create a pointer that could hold that address, I could set that pointer to different types of function with the same signature, right? And just call them. So if I could have a function pointer that is a pointer that can hold the address of a function that returns void and receives two integers, if I could create a pointer like that, I could simply put the address of these two in those and in that function, in that pointer, and call the pointer itself I instead. So the parentheses you put in, in front of a function, that's actually an operator. That's a function call operator. If you put those parentheses in front of any pointer, compiler will attempt to call that pointer exactly 
as a, as a function. So how do we actually create a pointer to a function? So let's try and see if we can actually create one. So, uh, so first, uh, let's get rid of these two. We don't want them. And you got 95,000 warnings like, what the heck are you doing? So what do I want? I want, let's call it a function pointer. So I want to create a function pointer, OK, that receives two integers, right? That's what I want to do. That's what I want to create. Are we OK with this? Now, what do I do? I'll, to create a pointer, what do I add beside the name? If you have integer x, how do you create a pointer to an integer? Integer, if I want to create a pointer, what do I do to this type to make it a pointer? I add an asterisk, right? Integer pointer p, correct? So I would like to do that over here too. So I'm going to say void pointer. But there is a problem in here. You are saying this is going to be confused with this, which is essentially a pointer that receives a void, a function that receives a void pointer. I need to make sure compiler understands I am not creating a prototype for a function, but I'm creating a pointer to a function. To do that, you need to make sure compiler understands the asterisk belongs to the pointer, not to the type. And that's what you do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a function pointer that can hold the address of any function that receives two integers. So in here, I can say func ptr is equal to sum. And then, is this correct? func ptr is equal to sum. And I can use the function pointer to actually call it. I can actually now say func ptr, I don't know, 10 and 20. Because it was set to sum, it's going to show the sum now. Now I can set the func ptr to, let's say, 500. And five, now it's going to divide 500 if I go func ptr uh, is equal to, oh, it's going to multiply it if I'm going to go product, something like that. So <clears throat> if I run the program now, you will see exactly what's about to happen. OK. All right, so it's going to run over here. First of all, x and y, we know that. So we know when I call sum, it's going to call sum. It's going to call product, it's going to call product, no biggie. But now, this function pointer is null, garbage in it, right? <clears throat> it's garbage. Now it's going to point to sum. Wherever sum was, func ptr is the same. And as you see, it's telling you that I'm holding the address of sum. You see that? So when you are calling func ptr, it's going to go to sum and execute sum. And now I'm going to say put, <clears throat> and I'm going to say put uh, prod into func ptr. And doing so, now func ptr is going to point to prod. And when I say call func ptr, this time it calls the product. Are we OK with this? Line thir 31? Line 31. It's only 29 lines. Am I? Yeah, 21. 21, 21, 21. OK, so in 21. Yeah, um, the sum part, what's its address? Why do you care? Um, it's somewhere in memory, and you know where it is. The name of each function holds the address of that function. Where do you care it is? Whatever it is, you can put it in func ptr because they have this exact same signature. Two integers and returning a void. And on purpose, I'm not putting anything in front of it, because I don't know what's going to get passed to it. 
any function that receives two integers will do. Are we okay with this, hopefully? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? So, okay, so now that we know what function pointers are, see how we can actually utilize it in the beautiful uh, uh, function that I had for, uh, what should we call it, for uh, uh, validation. So, so I'm going to say over here b dot func ptr. Dot cpp. And let's bring back. What the devil? I don't want OB244. I wish when you say open existing thing, it would show you the current directory first, but sadly it doesn't. So I have to go back here and open here, here, and here, and here. Copy. And I'm going to put that one in the prg.cpp and see what we can do. So, ladies and gents, let's say I want to validate an age. Let's say I want to validate an age. If you want to validate an age, what your function is supposed to be. So, if you wanted to replace this with something that, obviously in here I cannot print a message, right? That message has to be brought in. So in here, instead of, because the message, messages I can change. So in here I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say uh, string uh, message, right? I can do that. There is no problem in here. And I can simply say see out, see out message or error message or something. Right? I can do that. There is no problem with that. Are we okay with that? Let me just check something for a second. Yeah. Yeah, so I can just pass a message over there, right? We could make that message, ac message actually with the reference just to make sure I'm not occupying too much space and I'm using the same thing, so I'm just going to pass the message. And in here, I'm going to print out the message. So that's fine. I can do that. But if I want to actually show this over here, what do I do? What do I do for this function thingy? What should your function be? If you want to write a function that checks validity of something, let's say you want to forget about whatever you are writing. Let's say it's for age, OK? If it's for age, how do you write a function that can validate age? Obviously, the name could be valid age, right? And what should it receive? What is a parameter? Uh, An integer. An integer. Integer age. Okay? So that's what it's going to receive. And what is it supposed to return? An int? Now put your 345 hat and 244 hat and know that we have something that holds true false. What the, what you, a boolean, right? If it's true or not, if it's valid age or not, right? So, so valid, I want to see if it's valid. I'm not going to do anything just to see if it's valid or not. So I'm going to here say return uh, age being greater than or equal to 7 and age being less than or equal to 100. So that's my valid age, correct? And in here, instead of this, I am going to write valid age. And I'm going to pass the num to it. Are we okay with this? Right? And if I want this thing to be a valid number of students, it's the exact same thing. Valid number of students in class. Wow, look at the name of the function. Okay? And in here, I'm going to pass a num. And we'll say we need at least, like for a class to actually uh, uh, be held, yeah, what, what we did, five? I don't know, how many? Let's say five. If it's more than five and less than 35, that's a valid thing. 
and less than uh, 35, okay? Are we good? So now if I want to make my get int actually change it, check with the valid number of student in class, I have to change this function to that, right? I can't. So what is the signature of a pointer of this function? If the name of the function is, is valid. If the name of the pointer is valid, how do I create it? Should I choose a victim or we're going to have a volunteer? You see the function? Give me the signature for its pointer. How do I create the pointer? Bool, so we start with bool. Right? And obviously we're going to receive an integer, correct? And we need to indicate this is a pointer to a function, and therefore what I will do over here is this. So that's a, a pointer to a function that receives an integer and returns Boolean. Is that correct? Are we okay with this? So this is what I'm going to do. Ta-da! I pass it as an argument to my int. And I'm going to call the function using that. Now when I call my int, instead of saying get int just by that, in here I'm going to say invalid age. Try again. And what I'm going to pass over here is valid age. So now my get int is going to get called, oh, can't do reference, ah. Okay, now my get int is going to get called using valid age, right? And now if I want to get the number of students in class, Now in here I'm going to say int num is set to get int. This time it's going to be valid. What did I call that? Valid number of students in class. I think it's too long. It doesn't like it. <laughs> valid number of students in class. And the string message is going to be invalid number of students in class. So now when I write this function, in the specifications of the function, I'm going to say it receives a pointer to a validation logic that receives an integer and returns a Boolean. Therefore, I can reuse my logic as I go without rewriting the valid in thingy that we have. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? You look like a question mark. <laughs> are we good? We are good. Are we good? And that's pointer to functions. And this concept is C. It has nothing to do with C++. Okay? <clears throat> but the difference is that when you are calling a, a pointer to a function in C language, you have to put an asterisk over here. That's the only difference. You need to do this. That's the C syntax for it. So you have to actually, let me see if I, if it, if I can call it like that in here. Yeah, yeah, I can. So that's the C syntax. Okay, so that's C syntax. Okay. And this will be the C++ syntax. Obviously, you can call, uh, you can use C syntax and C++, but you cannot do it the other way, right? C++ syntax. Now, if I run the program, it will work for both cases. It doesn't make any difference what I have. So when it's aged, the validity is going to 
I didn't fix that double message, did I? I did? I don't know, we'll find out. So if I put over here onto three, four, five, something like that, invalid age, try again. I put three, invalid age, I put garbage, invalid integer, so that's good. Now I'm gonna say 34, it's gonna say age, number of students in class, like that, invalid number of students. So you see another validation is being called in here. And like that, we can actually save lots of time. Oh, I forgot actually to mention that we, this is the number of students in class, but anyways. So see how. <clears throat> All right. Do we understand what uh, pointer to functions are? Question? Should suggestion? Objection? <clears throat> Another thing that these pointers can do that is very uh, useful is that you can actually, let me see if I have an example over here for it so I don't have to rewrite it for you. Yeah, so you can actually put them in an array. <clears throat> so in here I'm gonna say use of, so VC, I'm gonna say use of func, func ptr.cpp. <clears throat> you can actually serialize execution like this. Take a look. I'm creating like this add sub thingy that we had, okay? I can create an array of pointer to functions, four of them, and initialize them to add sub multiplication and division. And, when I, and I can issue the same function on the two values over and over in a loop. You could never do that, right? That's pretty cool. You can actually call different functions in a loop based on the logic that you have. So <clears throat> it works the same thing, it doesn't make any difference, just, just for you to know. So you run it, it's good, just press F10 and you go through it and you'll see that one by one when it goes, it's gonna go to a different function uh, <clears throat> in every and each execution. So first it sets the, uh, the four pointers and every single time, first it's gonna go to add, <clears throat> then it's gonna go to subtract and it keeps going like that. So different functions are called based on the <clears throat> values that are held in it. So, stop it, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna call this one <clears throat> CD calling different functions with same signature in a loop, not CPP. <laughs> okay. The names of the, of the files are signature for the file. All right, are we okay down to this point? Obviously, when we are in C++, they say, oh, that's not object-oriented. That's not object-oriented. Because what I'm doing over here, I'm holding the logic of something, and I'm just go, so that function call is essentially go to that logic somewhere in memory. I can go to, like, having a pointer of a function, it means you can call it from anywhere. There is no encapsulation. It is like the lowest level of calling a logic ever. It's like you're writing assembly code. You're literally writing, saying, this is an address, go to it and execute it. That's literally what's happening here. So, uh, we need to know what is the object-oriented version of this after these messages. <laughs> so I'm gonna go for a break, we're gonna go come back five minutes, digest what just happened, and then we're gonna come back to, to what we called functors. So we had function pointers, now we're gonna do function objects. Okay, so that's the next one. <clears throat> And um, please remind me to resume uh, recording after I come back, after we come back, and I just lost my status bar. I hope that, there we go. Why can't we pass logic in C++? 
why can't we pass the logic in C++? We are, we, we are creating a container of object, of, of functionalities, right? What is a container of functionality? A class. I can put functions inside the class. All I need to do is to be able to call a class like a function. Do I make sense? So what happens when you create, what is the difference between a class and a structure? You create a class, you create a structure, structure has some uh, properties in it, then you write a function, you pass the structure to it. That sucks, we don't want it. Then we create a class, we put the functionalities inside the class. Now our class can hold functional, uh, uh, behavior. So how do we call it? We put the function name dot behavior, correct? And therefore it calls it. Does it make sense? Okay. Again, uh, one of the beautiful things of teaching in person instead of uh, online that I don't have to keep pulling you say, do you understand? And, you, and I see people say yes, 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 yes. And, and probably they said they're the little sister. Sit over here. As soon as you see a message, click yes. Okay. So, so uh, you did it, didn't you? <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. So uh, right now I look at your faces and kind of it shows me if, if you are actually wondering what I'm talking about. So yeah. So when we have a class, we can actually put functions inside a class then we instantiate the class. So class A, then I'm going to say A.print, and it prints it. But I cannot say class A and then call A. I cannot create a class for validation. The main purpose of, see, your class is a multi-behavior thing. It, do, it does many different things. But if your class is solely made to do validation, then you should be able to create a class called validation and call the, and create validation VLD, for example, and then call the VLD. Don't put any dot after. If I could do that, then I could pass classes for their main purpose, like validation that we have done now. So instead of writing different functions standing alone, because that's not object-oriented, right? It's not object-oriented to create functions for validation and pass the address of functions. I should create objects holding validations and pass the object instead. That's what I want to do. So if I wanted to create a class whose sole purpose is to add two integers, I should be able to say class add. So this add class of mine, its sole purpose is to add, if I can bring it up, there you go. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then I need, I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to say, add a and I want to say a and I have integer x 10 and y 20 I want to be able to say a x y and probably receive an integer over here say integer sum is like that how can I do that Yeah, but which operator? Yeah, there you go. We just, I just told you two seconds ago that the parentheses you put in front of, the parentheses in, you put in front of the function is like square brackets that you put in front of an array. You could overload that. Why not overloading the parentheses? You can do that. Which means I'm going to say, when this function add is called, I want it to be int operator function call. So overload the operator function call for this, receiving an integer a and an integer b. 
and return A plus B. Why is it giving me an O? Oh. And done. See out sum. If I can write it, of course, sum, sum, and then sum. So what I, so <clears throat> I hope you understand the the importance and kind of a, a turning point of programming here where you can actually define an object whose sole purpose is to do something special and pass it through. That add could have been validation. And you can pass objects around. Why pass address of, the op uh, address of a function? That's not a good thing to do. That's not object oriented. Instead of creating that validation, I could create validation classes whose job are to validate things properly as they go through whatever. So any, <clears throat> any, fun any class that has an operator overload for parentheses is called a functor or function object. Their job is to, they, they are mostly written <clears throat> to do a main thing and that's the functions they pass. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the main function that they hold. So they put their main function in it, and <clears throat> it, it works that way. So let, let me give you another example. So, uh, and the good thing about, see, when you have, when you have, when you have a, when you have a, uh, function pointer, all you have is logic. That logic doesn't have state. Can anybody tell me what the heck that meant? What is state? What is, when I say something has a state, what is, what? You all pass web programming, right? Like you have done, you have done web, you did, you did do some, Internet thingy, created web pages, right? Why everybody's laughing? Like, you did, right? You created HTML, HTML pages, correct? Did you create? When you submit something in HTML, what happens to the data? They all vanish as in each submit, submission, right? So essentially, that's what they call, they say a web page is stateless unless you use something like uh, ASP.NET, or you use uh, Java server pages, or you use, um, I don't know, JavaScript to hold the state in cookies and things like that. Do you remember that? No, you don't remember, do you? No? <laughs> so, how can I, what is the difference between stateful and stateless? Okay? A stateful thing remembers what it did before. A stateless thing does something and forgets everything. That's literally why we need object orientation. Because you call functions and functions forget everything. You put the functions inside a class, the function gets called, and it's still the attributes are there. So it can remember what it did before. It can hold its success in an attribute. It can remember what was the last output in a string. It can remember if validation was successful or not. Are we okay? You are still look like you still look like a question mark. Are we? Are we okay? Do we understand what is the difference between stateful and stateless? A function is stateless. Of course, we put a static variable in there and we say now we can remember what it was before. But that static variable is shared between all different aspects of that function, not for different ones, of different calls. For each call, you don't have a separate state. This is what we have in here. If, let's put it this way. Let's say I have a class line, okay? So the sort purpose of this class is to draw lines, 
Okay? That's what I want to do. Now I can put over here character and call it fill and put something like say dashes in here which means by standard a line is drawn with with dashes. Are we okay? All right? Now in here what do I do? And now I can create a, a, a constructor for this, say public, and I can put over here something like line, and in here I'm going to say character fill, and I am going to set m fill to that fill value that we have. Okay, so that's my default constructor, uh, that's my single uh, argument constructor, right? And uh, Uh, I'm going to remove that default value uh, and, and I'm going to put it in here. So we don't need that default, but anyways, okay? So that's my constructor for this thing, okay? So it can either create. Now what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to say void operator and in here I'm going to say um, size t uh, length, right? Now uh, in this... Uh, Oh, what am I doing? Size T length, and in here I'm gonna say for size T set to zero, and uh, size T I set to zero, I less than len, and I plus plus, and I'm gonna say C out, C out, uh, what am I C outing? C out, uh, uh, M fill, right? Okay. Now, what happens over here? It becomes a stateful thing, which means I can create. A, um, I have the add. Um, let me have it as two different ones. Uh, e functor. F functor. Oh. And huh. I lost everything. All right. That's okay. So I'm going to come over here. So I have line. Now in here I can say line L. And I, I can have line. Uh, line dash, okay, and I'm going to have line with star. That's eight, that's not star. Okay, now I can say dash 10. Uh, I like to return an O stream in here. Oh, C out. <laughs> return. <laughs> oh, sometimes my brain works in wondrous ways. Okay, so return C out. Now in here I can go dash and go to new line. And then I'm going to go star 20 and go to new line. Right? So what happens over here, dash prints dashes 10 times and star prints star. Didn't I change it to star? Or I thought I changed it to star. All right. And now my stars are stars. Okay? So you see the difference over here? The functions, I'm not saying dash dot draw. I'm not going to say star dot draw because I know dash, I can say, I can say dashes or stars. Okay? And it's going to draw a line of that because that's its sole purpose. Are we okay with this? All right. So, if that is the case, let's do something else.
Just a second. Now I'm going to do this. So we're okay with this line thingy? We're okay, right? See what I'm going to do. I'm going to say class validation. Okay? And the validation of class of mine has a protected arguments. Because when you do validation, you don't want them to do it more than a few times, right? When you do that, if like you're getting a password, you're checking to see if the password is correct or not, more than three times you want to stop them, right? So probably we want to know what is the number of validation. So it's a good idea to have something like integer number of validations. Okay? Validations. Set it to zero. Are we okay with that? And I'm going to say public. And in here, I'm going to say virtual, since I know you love virtuals. Virtual. And in here, I'm going to say bool operator. And in that operator, I'm going to get an integer value. OK? And, and I'm going to get a string, string, say, error message. Are we good? Let me just see. Oh, I keep forgetting that I have to put two. All right. So operator yada yada receives an integer. So that's the validation that I'm going to do for an integer, and it's going to get that, and that's it. So that's my validation, and Why am I getting an error in here? Oh. All right. So my base of validation is something like this, validation for an integer. So probably I should have called it integer validation, but let's call it validation, right? So <clears throat> or int validation. So my int validation is something like this, all right? So it accepts an integer value, and it, and it does the validation. Now, if I want to actually write a validation for, say, uh, age, class, valid age, class valid age, and valid age of mind publicly inherits integer validation. And that integer validation has one public thing over here that is Boolean operator uh, uh, integer value and string error message. Mm, not going to put that. And that's that. And the next one I'm going to have over here will be something like, uh, the other one was what? Valid number of students. So, or uh, that's too long. Give me another integer for validation. Uh, a mark, valid mark. So I'm going to go class. Valid mark. That is going to be, again, the same thing, the exact same thing over here. OK, so I have now two classes over here created out of integer validation, right? So what I will do, uh, I will just implement the validation for each, uh, each one of them properly. So essentially, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say auto, um, or uh, let's convert that one later on 
by yourself. I'm going to say valid age. Um, uh, operator uh, equal int validation and <clears throat> string error message. And for the validation of these things, I'm going to uh, uh, Yeah, I'm going to just print the message. So I'm going to say if, uh, so validation is for uh, whatever it was. So I'll do the validation over here, something like uh, less than or equal to, um, if it's less than or equal to seven, I'm going to say too young. Uh, I'm going to say see out error message. Mm. You know what I'm going to do? Let me change these things to references. I'll tell you why. I'm going to make these things to actually set the message out there to whatever it is. Like this, it's going to be better. So I'm going to make the string go out instead of coming in. Yeah, so I don't print anything in here. So in here, I'm going to say string reference. That's better. No, I'm going to say error message set to, what do I do? Mm, too young to program, to program, okay? And in here I'm going to say number of tries. I can actually mention how many. So in here, I'm going to say, what is that? Um, um, uh, I can do two. Uh, do I have string head over here set? Include string. So I'm going to say two string. And I'm going to put uh, the value that I have. That is m number of validations. And uh, that's it. Number of tries is this much. And I'll do it like this. OK? So now I am setting up the message exactly how I want. And it passes the information back to whoever wants to use this. So um, uh, other than that, else if, let's say, this val is greater than 100, greater than 100, I'm going to say to all two program. Else if to all two program, and that's that. Why does it give me an error over here? That should work, doesn't it? Oh. I forgot it's a string. So in here I'm going to go plus, and in here I'm going to go plus, because I want to print one string. There you go. So it sets the message to that one. That's better. OK. So error message, it's going <clears> to <throat> set it to that. And what else? Yeah, so let's be pessimistic. Uh, Boolean result is false. <clears throat> Other than this, I'm going to say uh, result is true. And error message, error message is blank. Return res. So by doing something like this, 
Now, valid mark is going to be the exact same thing, so I'm just going to copy it over here and put it like that. So this is going to be valid mark. Valid mark. And if it's less than zero, I'm going to say only positive numbers. And if it's more than 100, value too large, OK? Number of threads, this one, it's the same thing. So now, <clears throat> valid mark is doing the exact same thing. Now, all I need to do is to have the functionality that the, function, the, the uh, valid integer program that I have to receive any type of uh, validation from me. So I'm going to bring back the uh, <clears throat> function that I had for receiving the value, the integer thingy that I have, and I'm going to use a functor instead. So I'm going to copy this one, and now in here, instead of receiving uh, an integer value, in here what I'm going to receive will be uh, int validation <clears throat> reference, uh, I'm going to call it valid, okay? And in here, I'm going to say I have a message to show. So in here, I'm going to say string message, string message. And I'm going to remove this so I don't need the message over here anymore. I'm going to say, and I'm going to make it empty. And I'm going to say if valid num, and I'm going to pass the message to it. So now it works the exact same way, but the difference is that my integer validation is receiving <clears throat> a reference of validation. That could be anything because it's mother of these two validations, valid mark and valid age, I can pass any of them if I want to. It doesn't make any difference. So in my program, in here, I'm saying no matter what type of validation it is, call it, because the function uh, pointer, uh, the function uh, operator is overloaded, it is going to call the proper one based on what the object is, Therefore, in here, all I need to do is to say, uh, what was the name? Valid mark. Valid mark. I'm going to say um, V mark. And valid, uh, what was the other one? Valid age, I think. Yes, V age. Okay. And when I'm actually calling the the function, when I'm calling the function to do the integer validation, it's going to be uh, um, get int, so integer age, get int, and I'm going to pass the valid age to it. Because the object valid age is passed to this get int, the function is going to be called is regarding validation for an age. And if anybody wants to call my get int, all they need to do is to create a function inheriting integer validation and do the proper validation in its format, and they are done. So the difference between this one and the pointer uh, function that uh, uh, pointer to uh, function that I had was that the validation is stateful. It can actually test for each one of them to see how many times the validations were done. And uh, the next thing is good about it is that it's object oriented. Okay, so that get in thingy that you see the next time you are coming in, I'm gonna. Uh, you're coming in or you yeah, the next time we are online on Friday, I'm going to actually make this fully object oriented with uh, an object being validated instead of uh, uh, calling a function. But complete this code, I have to 
Uh, it's the end of the class. I have to leave because I have to reach to the other one. But I'm going to say complete the code for the other one. So the other one is integer mark set to get int v mark. Let me just uh, compile it, make sure it's, it's, perf it's, it's OK. Control F7. The execution and test lies on your shoulder for the next one that you are coming in. OK? Walk through it, and you will see the functor actually will be called properly based on the uh, object that it's uh, working with. OK? Uh, I'm going to save it. So I'm going to say uh, execution not tested. Execution not tested. Save it, and I'm going to push everything right now. Please take a look at it for the next time. Next time, I'm going to put this in, in full action with all the uh, uh, um, object-oriented features that it had. Also, we're going to work on a new type of function. So we talked about pointer to functions, right? We talked about functors. The last thing we are going to talk about is lambda expressions to see how you can actually have a variable holding a function, OK? A variable holding a function, OK? We're going to come to that, all right? Have yourself a beautiful day. Bye-bye, and see you soon. Thank you.